What we're going to do is, don't worry, we're just doing a little bit of an, um, an opening address and a welcome. Then Brad's going to come up, and uh, he's going to say hello, hello to you. And I've asked him to do the honors of the prayer for the Sukkot ahead of us together. And then we're going to have young Stephen come up and blow the official Sukkot uh, opening on the shofar. And then we're just going to start to relax and start to have some fun. Is that all right? Okay. So I'll get through this pretty quick. Um, all right. House of Israel, the um, three ministry aspects, just so you're aware. Anybody who's not aware of Carol and Brad and the ministry with Wild Brands Ministry, they are both here. Ask them a ton of questions if you need to. Um, they've been doing a wonderful ministry for almost 25 years now under Wild Branch Ministry. So, um, and, uh, and they've, uh, you know, the fathers use them all over the world and uh, to help the body grow and actually understand this incredible time we're in. So um, if you're not familiar with Wild Branch Ministry, go in and make sure you have a look. Um, who here is familiar with Bible Pathway Adventures? Hands up. Okay. Um, Pip's here with us. And uh, she's and so you can go bug her uh, on, on all that kind of thing. And, uh, well, we won't worry about the donkey. We'll just keep going on that one. Um, House of Israel. I've just found this little picture here, and I just want to reiterate something. Um, I am... What does this mean? Hebrew means to cross over. I am Hebrew. I am Hebrew because I have crossed over from man-made traditions and lies into biblical truth. Amen? Can everybody give the Father a hand for that one? All right, give him a hand. Because this is something we're grappling with. Do you know right now, as a people, is is anybody find exciting what's going on around the world right now? Listen, Nate, nobody can orchestrate this because we haven't had a House of Israel conference. Yet we are seen all over the world, and Brad and Carol will both attest to this as well. There is things that are beyond our ability to manufacture, and that's the fingerprint of the Ruach. All right? And so it's neat. We're in very exciting times. Um, so w- who wants to be included with the end times prophecy of the restoration of the house of Israel? Who would like that? Huh? Okay. All right. So, um, again, if you haven't got these, these are the website addresses. Come in and track any of us down if you need them. A lot of the teachings go up there. A lot of stuff there in Bible Pathway Adventures and stuff for the parents and the children. This is all discipleship-based. And same with Wild Branch Ministries and a lot of what they do. And in particular, they also have a focus with uh, the youth ministry. And Brad's actually going to be giving um, some youth sessions this weekend. Uh, three of them. Is that right? I got that? Yeah. Um, okay. Everybody, please remember this. A noise curfew, not to be uh, too harsh on this, but starting at 10.30 p.m. Uh, every day or every night, we are going to be putting this into place. So please, at around 10.30, let's say, all it's saying is just be conscious of, of others, right, at this time, um, so that people can have some sleep. Uh, identify your tribe. Um, on the back wall here. Go find out what tribe you're a part of, and this will just relate to keeping things going and, and, uh, and going smoothly over the course of the week. Um, parents must supervise and get a key to the flying fox and the canoe shed. These, these are for us to use and to enjoy, but they must be under supervision, and it must, we must know that it's going on. Uh, okay, everybody help tidy up tonight and on the other dinners over this opening weekend, which we've actually done. So thank you, everybody, for that. And we'll be doing that over the next two nights as well, uh, just until we get going. And there's also uh, even more of a numbers over this opening weekend. So I think I've got it. The last one was some of the things to do with photos and pictures. Yeah. If anybody has any issue at all with being, um, you know, having a photo randomly taken or something's gone up on, because it may make it onto a social media or somebody's Facebook or whatever, if for any reason this bothers you, um, please politely and respectfully go and speak to that person, okay? I don't think anybody's going to have an issue making sure they look after you. Is that okay? So the person who's taken it, as well as take the responsibility if you're one who doesn't, okay? It's okay. You can go and speak to them. We're all family here, and they'll respect that both ways. Understood? Okay. Uh, who here is looking to mikvah, baptize, baptisms this weekend? Okay, because I know we've got about four. 
Anybody here, if you, and if you're being led, or if you are led, even by being here, um, I want you to come and see me personally, okay? We're going to look at doing this um, on Sunday at, uh, what do we got here, 11 a.m. on both weekends. And uh, so there's just some things I can share with you and take you through this whole understanding of a mikvah. So um, just come and see me, speak to me, and uh, we're going to organize a pre-session, which will either be on the Sunday morning before that or on the Saturday uh, afternoon. Okay? Does everyone have that? So just come and uh, tap me on the shoulder, uh, besides those who already have. Um, the location to be announced. I noticed driving in today with Brad that uh, I wasn't <laughs> the place where we were looking at doing them. I didn't look like that was too mikvai. Whatever we but so. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my special Hebrew. Brad will explain it when he comes up. Um, okay, ten matters of Sukkot. Um, these are just the matters for us. So this is our own house family gathering for 2017, okay? Um, they do not replace the covenant. All right, so they, that what this is, is this is our own little household rules for these. But Sukkot is a time of celebration. Everyone get that? Okay, let's remember that. Let's, it really is. The Father is actually telling us to enjoy, get together and enjoy each other. Because we are actually, does anybody know why there's a hoopah up here? Because we are actually in the dress rehearsal and the celebration of what? The wedding feast, yes. So, um, for all those that are, that are here, um, at the start of the wedding feast, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And, um, and the fact is, is that He's looking at our hearts. Do we care to even be here? You know, have we actually considered why he has these as Moedims and how they point to an end times uh, prophetic fulfillment? And they will be fulfilled literally. We're going to speak a little bit about that uh, over the coming days. Um, help your brother or sister in need. I know that sounds like, well, of course, right? Everybody hears, of course. Of course, of course, right? of course. Um, you know what, though? I don't know if you're like me, but I'm really good at this. Somebody's dying on the way, and I'm walking down the path, and they're, you know, they've got, you know, something sticking through their side or something, and and I'll miss it. Well, it could do. What what I'm saying is this: just be aware, right? Just just be aware as as much as you can. I'm as guilty as anyone, but sometimes it's just the simplest of little things. But you know what? If we can't help each other, how do we actually help a world that's dying out there right now? Agreed. So let's keep our eyes open for each other. Um, have biblical conversations, not divisive disputes. Does everyone know the difference? <laughs> right. Divisive. <laughs> Brad, is it divisive? <laughs> All right. Um, Okay, so this one here, we're just going to talk a little bit about in a second after the slide here. Take any offense directly to your brother or sister first. I promise you, if somebody comes to me or anybody here that's a part of the eldership and the leadership team um, uh, and it has a complaint about a brother or a sister and they've not spoken to that person first, guess what I'm going to say to them? Yeah. Go and speak. Do you know that, it, that in the Brit Hadashah, in the New Testament, what does it say in Matthew 18? If you have an offense, who do you speak to first? Right. And we don't go and gossip about these things, and we don't hold it in our heart and be all bitter and have our own little conversations. We go, and we treat each other with the love and respect that our Elohim wants us to do. Is that fair? So if, we, if that happens, it's okay. Everybody can have an offense at time. If somebody can unintendedly offend somebody, go and speak to them. Okay? If we can't learn to do this again as a family, how does the world look at our behavior and know us by how we love one another? Keep the camp tidy at all times. I know that's, you think it's a given, but it's not our place. This is a temporary dwelling, and there's going to be people that are going to be looking at our witness as guests. So we just want to remember that, all of us, right? By the way, I'm not saying anything here that I'm not saying to me. Um, parents are responsible for their own children. Make sense? <laughs> now, that being said, nothing stops us helping each other and being a part of a village community when it comes to the kids, right? But we don't want to assume it, nor do we want to ignore it. We just want to work together uh, as a family. So, But ultimately, 
you know, um, the kids are the responsibility of the family nucleus. Agreed? Okay. Respect those who are sleeping. That doesn't, that doesn't just mean at night. Do you know, do you know that there's some people that wake up a little later than others? <laughs> now, yes. Does anybody think I had something to do with this matter? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. We, we want to, we want to respect it both ends. Um, because believe it or not, to the early risers and the early Tibetans, Yah actually does work late into the evening. <laughs> and, and even things like prayer occurs. <laughs> And fellowship and all these things. So all those who are meeting and a part of the prayer groups and whatnot, that is fantastic. Being in the evenings, being in the morning. But if somebody is not present at one or the other, either in the evening or in the morning, no self-righteous stares. (laughs) Where are they? All right. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they're going through, nor what they've been called to as a part of this Sukkot, do you? So who's the judge on all this? Yeah. Okay. What we do want to do is come together and pray for one another, whether it be one on one or whether you're being led to pray as a group or as a part of the teams. Okay. Everybody agree? Prayer is a special part of this. Sicko. Uh, guard and honor the Sabbath. Everyone agree with that? Okay. All right. Uh, and so that's something that uh, that I'm glad everybody's agreeing on here. We'll keep going. Uh, respect camp facilities at all times. Kitchens, showers. Toilets, whatever, okay? Um, treat them literally as the best possible guests that we are, okay? All right? So it's just really um, respectful of each other. Is that okay? All right, we can agree with that. All, uh, all the uh, teachings over the course of this next week, they will be recorded. So just be respectful as we can. Every once in a while, something happens beyond your control, and that's okay, right? Life's going to happen. But just please be respectful as it's going on because um, there are a number of people that are very interesting in some of the messages that are going to be over the next week. Obviously, having Scott uh, uh, doing some of the teachings. Uh, sorry, Brad, <laughs> doing some of the teachings. Um, is, is, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, so we just want to be respectful of that because these messages are going to go out uh, essentially pretty wide. So, um, And hopefully they can bless others too that are on the same journey. Has anybody here ever thought it was nice when you get confirmation from somewhere else outside your immediate camps and you find out that the Father's doing the exact same thing with them as he's doing with us? Isn't that neat? So we want to bless others too, right? Okay. Food for thought. We are going to have people that are here at the beginning of this journey. The, this is going to be the, just the crux of my message before we're about to get brought up. Some people are experiencing right now as we speak, sitting with each other, they're at the beginning of a journey, and guess what? Some of this stuff here is too Jewish. Okay? That's actually happening to people right now. You don't know who it is in this room, but there are people that are wondering, what is with all this Jewish stuff. They're not yet learned to understand that we're actually in a father's appointed times and that there are certain things that have been a part of an ancient history, the ancient past, and some of these things have come through to today. Why we even see. People think this, this menorah is a Jewish symbol. Everyone know that's not a Jewish symbol? Okay, we're not, this isn't anything against the tribe of Yehuda. But this is not, this is not Jewish. What it does represent though is the seven kahal or Ecclesia, or the church. And you will find written in Revelation. The seven golden lampstands. This is something that's very important. Now, Yehuda has preserved some things. Is everyone glad that, that Yehuda has preserved some things that we can understand? Yeah. And so we want to bless our brothers, right? In, in Yehuda. But you know what? They also too, and one day, they're not only have already been blessing us, but we can give some things back to them too. Okay? And so there's an incredible story unfolding on the earth right now. And we want to enjoy that. Um, and we want to be a part of it. Here's the other thing. Not Jewish enough. you got to try my seat in all this, you know. Seriously. We've gotten to the stage because a lot of us have, have come out of uh, whatever journeys we've been on. And we've learned how to look at these things, these Moedim, these appointed times. But often, we may have learned it purely only from a Jewish sense. 
And a lot of traditions and things have come up on that side. That's okay. I've enjoyed incredibly Jewish Sukkot, and, and I love them. And I don't tell them what they can and cannot do. But a lot of things in them are tradition. Does everybody understand that tradition is not necessarily a bad thing? Because tradition can have some really interesting reasons as to why it's tradition. Right? And that can make us dig deeper in the Word. However, we don't put tradition above the... Yeah. And so we are on a journey where we're going to try and find the river on this one, and we're going to help each other along the way. So if it's too Jewish for you, some things, the shofars and everything else, to not being Jewish enough because there's not enough traditions, as you may have understood so far in your journey, it's okay. Go to the Father, go to your brother, and enjoy your family right now. Because is everyone trust the Father's going to lead us? Okay, and all of this, let's trust him. Okay, but we don't want to be having arguments, especially over things that are actually tradition. Instead, you might want to ask somebody who honors and celebrates the tradition. We'll have the luva waving tomorrow, and there's going to be some Israeli dancing and things like this. These are wonderful things. Well, like, do you know if you go into the modern state of Israel today, and you know how we have the branches and even a citrus fruit? And we're told we bring into the whole celebration of Sukkot. Do you know that they're in, even in those camps, in their traditional camps, you have rabbinical schools that are going to argue, no, they're used to decorate the sukkahs, and others are saying it's used to do the waving of the loot. Do you know that? And they don't actually argue about this in the land. They're actually arguing a tradition. What it does say is to bring these things and to celebrate. Now, what do we do with that? You see, this, these traditions have grown up based on the actual words of Scripture. But don't think that a tradition is the only way you can celebrate with what the Father has asked you to bring. What's important is that we understand why he's asked us to. Does that make sense? And then we can start to understand and make these distinctions. But these are important because I've seen arguments and divisive behavior as a part of this journey, and there's no reason for it. Ask somebody why they do what they do, and fellowship with them, and guess what? You might just get to know them. Remember, traditions are fun and interesting, but they should never be divisive. Divisive. (laughs) Who here is the source of all truth? Right. I'm glad, I'm glad. It was a great answer. All right. But that's not what I mean. We all get that. Who here in the flesh is the source of all truth? In this room right now? No. Has anyone here ever been wrong before? So you're not the holder of all truth, but have you ever been wrong about anything? I'll, I'll ask the wives to answer this for the men, and then we'll ask the vice versa. If... You know you've been wrong, and we're on a journey, and the Ruach is pouring out across the world, and I promise you, Brad and I have had some interesting discussions on just literally what he is starting to reveal right now. And this goes from the teachers to the servant leadership to all of the things in the journeys right across the board. And we must really understand this, that he is the holder of righteousness. He is set apart. He understands all of these things, and we are learning so let's learn together, right? Has anybody ever here been right and then found out they were still wrong? Yeah. So even when you're right and you're in this and you're telling your brother or your sister, just remember, is this about proving who's right and who's wrong? Because if it is, let's go back and read about the restoration of the house of Israel because apparently there's two sticks coming together. And guess what? They've had a little bit different journeys. And those different journeys have some interesting things that come with them. And we've got to learn what this looks like in our character. Does everyone agree that there's a world that's going to be watching our character as we claim to be following the Ruach? And we claim to have and know the one called Messiah. Yeshua Messiah. And then we're going to have these stupid little disputes with each other. And you don't even know whether you're going to have even maybe that same view to that same level, that same way, because the Father might actually grow your understanding. Let's love each other along the way. Let's fellowship things out. Let's treat each other with the respect that the Father treats us with. Because guess what? 
All of us in here, we're here because who decided we were allowed to be here tonight? Yes, and if he's putting up with us, can we help put up with each other? Because he's a lot holier than any of us in here. All right? Okay. All right. Uh, fireside chats. Um, these are going to be every night at 9 p.m. There's going to be a tent set up here tomorrow, and that tent is going to have a little fireplace in it, whatever it is. We're just going to have it right outside here, and we're going to mingle. Anybody who's interested at 9 o'clock onwards... Um, uh, Brad and I are just going to be coming together and enjoying some fellowship. And we're going to actually look at some questions and things like that. So some great fellowship, great conversations, awesome questions, right? And incredible answers. This whole time of Fireside Chats, the weird and wacky will be welcome. <laughs> so any of those people that want to get that out of your system, guess what? You're allowed to, okay? All right, we're going we're gonna to have some fun. But what? We're not going to be in... Divisive disputes. Divisive. <laughs> okay. Um, we're we're going to bring Brad up, and uh, Brad's uh, just going to say uh, a few words, and we can introduce him. I want you to really welcome our, uh, both Brad and Carol have come a long way to be with us. And they do a lot for the Father, and they have blessed the body of Messiah immensely. Can we welcome them both up, please? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can safely say Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom as well because we've entered into a Shabbat. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm only just going to, I'm not even going to talk about what I'm going to talk about uh, this week. I just came up just to say hello and to kind of get the ball rolling and introduce things. Uh, first of all, I want to say that Carol and I are very honored. We spend almost every year, all these years, at a different camp. And uh, rarely do we go to the same camp twice. And we are very honored to be uh, among you all. And we want to say that uh, uh, first of all. Um, this is, uh, well, it's different for us since, since it's kind of you know, backwards as far as time uh, is concerned. Um, but before we begin, I want to focus just for a few minutes. I didn't tell you I was going to do this, uh, Curtis, because you wouldn't have let me up here if I would have said so. <laughs> but... Um, the, the very first thing he had up there, I want you, everybody to keep in mind, more than anything else, and I'm not even going to choose between divisive and divisive, but, but uh, the, cel- the celebrating part of it, because the, the reality of the situation is the father did not confront Israel, did not stand before the 12 tribes and say, okay, now, Israel, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you guys seven feasts. I'm going to give you three in the spring, and I'm going to give you one in the summer. I'm going to give you three in the fall. And I want you to get out there, and I want you to have a good time. I want you to howl it up and hoot it up and have a good time during these three times of the year. So I'll go out there and get after it, and I'll see you next year. That's really not what happened. He went to a group of people who were already celebrating those three times. Because that's the reason why the feasts around the harvest the planting and the sowing and, and with respect to what goes in the field. And we don't do that anymore. So we really can't appreciate what it means to get out three times a year and celebrate the fact that you're going to live another year. You're going to be able to eat another year because the harvests are coming in. Are you about to go out and plant these things? We take that so much for granted, and especially in the United States, because, you know, when we want food, we just go down to the supermarket or the convenience store and we get a can of peas. And generally speaking, when we grab the can of peas off the shelf, we don't run around going, hallelujah, hallelujah, peas, peas, hallelujah, peas. That's not what happens, okay? As a matter of fact, most of us go to the store with our kids crying and we're, you know, like, oh, that, stop it. You know, we're fighting at the store. Now, I said that goofy illustration because for them, those three times of the year were the happiest, most celebratory part of their whole life. And so the idea of going out and taking these three times, especially in Sukkot, which was the last feast of the year, that was some serious, heavy-duty celebrating. We've forgotten so much of that in this walk in the world because we westernized it and turned it into uh, eight-day conferences, okay, with guest speakers, you know, <laughs> and, and, and things of that nature. Rather than, and, and we have a tendency instead of and what we need to do is not debate but celebrate. That's the purpose of this, to, to enjoy our time together because it may be a real reality here very soon, uh, especially everybody sees uh, what's going on in the world. So I'm, I'm going to start off with a little prayer here, and then we're going to have Stephen. Can, can tell, someone tell me, point out Stephen for me? Can someone, someone point? Is, is he, he's where? He's got the green hat. Okay, that's Stephen. 
Um, and I'm going to bring Stephen up. And while Stephen is blowing the shofar, I want, I want all of us to start that celebration by joining me in a little, and just a little chorus that we're going to say over and over from a, from a very popular song in the 70s. Now, if, if you weren't around in the 70s, you go, oh no. <laughs> you know, is this the old gray mare song or, you know, it is, okay, that's before the 70s, but nonetheless, uh, I want you to join me in that little chorus so we can really start this out with a bang. Okay, can we do that? Okay. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you and we thank you for this wonderful time of the year that you have given us, a a, a time to, to gather together without all the stress and all the responsibilities of the daily living that we have in our homes, and to get outside of that atmosphere and and join one another in practicing and rehearsing what is soon going to be a reality in our life. And those of us here can say that we have rehearsed for this, We know all that's going to take place, and so we look forward to all of it in anticipation of your great hand upon us during that day. So we thank you for this special time. We thank you for all of your feasts, but especially this one. And we give you praise and glory and honor as we celebrate in this gathering together time. We celebrate what you have provided for us. It may not be beets and tomatoes and wheat and corn, but there are so many things that you have provided for us and given us, whether we deserved it or not. So we take this one time a year to celebrate together. Yes, we're supposed to celebrate your life every day, but this is the time you have designed for all of us to come together and do it together. And we just praise that we will bless you in everything we set our hand to do. In Yeshua's precious name, amen and amen and amen. Come on up. Come on up, Stephen, and blow that shofar. And let's see what you got there, little buddy. One, two, three, four. Let's we put this up. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, some of you remember this and some of you won't. Okay, you ready? One, two, three, four. Celebrate, celebrate, dance to the music. Celebrate, celebrate, dance to the music. Harmony. Celebrate, celebrate. Dance to the music. Oh, celebrate, celebrate. Dance to the music. Come on, more. Celebrate, celebrate. Dance to the music. We'll celebrate, celebrate. Dance to the music. Celebrate. All right, let's do that. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right, everybody, enjoy yourselves. I'm sure a lot of you have traveled and you're tired. Others of you will just want to come, uh, have some fellowship tonight. It's wonderful to see a lot of the faces that I've gone to meet over the years, and uh, it's such a blessing to see you every time that I do. And uh, and we just we do welcome you, and it's so great to see you as family. Bless you all. Let's have a good night, and uh, let's start our journey on Sukkot. Okay, Shalom. We, um, just for those, I know we keep getting a little bit of rain here. The uh, weather's just all over the place. But um, um, Brad and I had a good chance to catch up with uh, Steve Berkson. Um, everybody here knows Steve from M2I, yeah? Um, so we caught up with them, and they're in Tennessee right now. And uh, they'd caught in the back end of a cyclone, was it? What, what did they? Hurricane. And uh, their mikvahs that actually had to be delayed, they got flooded out, um, and all sorts of things. So just when you're, we're feeling sorry for ourselves, you get testimony from somewhere else. I'm kind of thinking, oh, I'll actually take ours for now um, with some of the things that they've been having. But um, in any case, um, yeah, so hopefully the weather's going to uh, play uh, nicely again after today. All right, um, I've been uh, having a little bit of a struggle here because I'm sort of, a, again, trying to um, reduce a four-part teaching into a two-part sort of summary. So I'm going to be uh, doing part one of this today, and then Brad's back on tomorrow, and then I'll be back on. So we are going to look at authority crisis, and I've got usurping, understanding authority. Does everybody get a sense and understanding what usurping actually is? Mm. 
Um, what we're going to talk about here today, and uh, some of the fellowships, uh, both here, uh, in fact, our own and in New Zealand, but also overseas um, in various places, this is one particular teaching that has probably, if we are willing to really take this seriously and look into it, it produces some of the best fruit um, as we walk forward together as a body and in fellowship. Okay, so just remember, just remember that sometimes is everybody aware that sometimes that the the tougher subjects, if we're willing to um, work them through, can actually produce some of the best fruit. Sometimes it's good just to stay with the easier stuff. Um, but this is more application based, and and there'll be some things in here for some of you. Um, where it's going to probably, may, might touch a raw nerve, um, both for men and women. Um, my encouragement to you is just keep going. It's okay. There'll be some things here that'll make a bit more sense, and especially at the end of part two. Um, but as we look at something like this, we are dealing with human fallen nature. And does everybody know we're a work in progress? Yeah. So as we're a work in progress, has anybody here ever discovered that perhaps you were behaving in a way that you later found out wasn't so fruitful? You know, when this, when this happens to us, um, we got one of two choices. We continue to justify our actions. Those other people, those bad people. Or... We can listen to the Father, and sometimes it takes us to a place of repentance, to uh, teshuva, or uh, or metanoia in the Greek. We're going to take a little look at what is usurping the adversary and deception, the fruit of not understanding authority in the body. Um, one of the things that I often hear is, "Is all I hear from the Lord? I don't need anything." Anybody ever heard that before? Do you know that if that was truly Yah's structure, if that was truly how it worked, I don't even know why we'd need his word. Because most of the people I hear even saying that aren't even in the word. So we can either be a law unto ourselves and then cry, why aren't, don't we have any unity, you know, unity in the body and why we're getting divided and all this kind of stuff. Um, or we can actually try and get more of an understanding of perhaps a little bit of what Yeshua patterned why there is an authority structure, why there is a fivefold, um, but it is not Nicolaitism. Okay, this lording over the laity, this Nicolaitan. So there is a structure of leadership in the body, but it is servitude leadership. And that's a little bit different than perhaps some of the systems of authority that we see in Rome and certainly that we've seen uh, in the church quite often um, in the various denominations. Why does the design of men and women matter in this whole leadership thing? Because we're both the same. Everybody noticed that Rome's trying to make men, women, and women, men. Uh, how is it looking? It's looking pretty seriously bad. All you've got to do is turn on the nightly news to see that Rome hasn't figured this out yet, but unfortunately, the body of Messiah seems to be being infected and impacted by some of this stuff. We are called to be set apart and to understand Yah's design. It is better, it is more fruitful, it brings more joy, and it brings way more understanding of how we are to be as a witness to the world. We have a choice to make. You can... We all can do it his way and go to his word, or we can go to Rome. Rome is in collapse right now. And we're actually going to be discussing one of the biggest reasons I believe that it is. Unfortunately, we are seeing much of the believing body impacted by this. Um, just a few weeks ago, I was contacted by a fellowship in the States, and one of the things that they were able to start overcoming, some of the division and things that were coming into that fellowship, because they didn't understand what was going on, um, was understanding this matter of usurping. They'd come across some of the podcasts and got a hold of this actual series. The pastor phoned me up and basically said, you don't know who I am, but it's bringing healing and restoration to the fellowship. They didn't actually understand what was going on. 
Who here thinks they might have been guilty of usurping in your walk as a child, as a woman, as a servant leader, as a... Who here thinks that you may have done that? Yeah. Few honest hands. Yeah, there's one there from the kid. I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> I'm a usurper. <laughs> okay. Um, I love the honesty. I'll be in fairness. Okay, if you're a child in this room, you've usurped. Okay, <laughs> you've done it. Um, not knowingly, um, but you're doing it unknowingly. Um, and if you are alive and breathing in this room, it's likely you've usurped as well. And remember, I'm speaking from a position of questions at the end here. Okay, we're going to get into that. Don't you worry. Okay, just save the questions to the end, okay? Um, you'll find that, that you, they may go away by the time we get to the end of them. Um, so, if we're all guilty, potentially, of something that's causing division, do you think that it may be... Um, do you think it might be wise for us maybe to be willing to discuss this as a body? If indeed my assumption here or what I'm trying to relay is true, can usurping cause division? So we're going to just have a look at what this really is and how this relates into authority. Uh, solution, application of understanding of that biblical authority, and then the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we'll visit that, uh, the bottom three, four of these in part two. Okay, here's the problem. If you do not understand the authority in any given situation or circumstance, okay, this will ultimately lead to confusion and division. Has anybody been in an emergency situation where you did not have an authority or a recognized situation and, you, and you're actually looking for it because something's happening, you don't have control of it, and you're unable to directly affect the right outcome? Has anybody ever experienced that? You're actually in an emergency, yeah. It's not fun, is it? And and when you're in that situation, you got one of two things. You can freak out or you can try and assume the authority position yourself. Who here is comfortable if you're in a medical emergency and um, and all you've got is, I don't know, let's say a car mechanic who's willing to step up and take over the situation? Who here would like a medical authority helping you with a medical issue? Who would like that? Yeah. Okay. That doesn't mean that the person stepping up, if that's all they've got, is not a situation where, hey, at least we got someone helping. But if we are understanding the correct authority in a correct situation, it will start to breed good fruit. But if we are not able to recognize that, nor look to it, nor be willing to actually submit into it, we can start to create real problems right throughout the body. And this is going to happen at all levels, from marriages to kids to servitude leadership structures and all these sorts of things we see in the gatherings. We all have our freedoms, okay? This is the price of being Torahless. Okay? Does everybody know that the Father's tour is not burdensome, but if we took you down to the halls of litigation, even just here in New Zealand, you're going to have a few hundred thousand laws, which you may or may not be aware of. I promise you the price of our godlessness is costing us our freedom. Because every time we don't get these basic principles of the word... We have to put in another rule to try and overcome. And as this happens, we're going to slowly get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And the more squeezed we get, how does it feel? Yet somehow the Father's Torah, you know, is so burdensome and all these sorts of things. I tell you, if we lived by the Torah, the freedom we would experience and understand as a people would be incredible to what you're currently experiencing with the oppression of Rome. So just know our world is Torahless, and this is why you are seeing, whenever you see solicitors becoming a growing business, lawyers, you know you're in trouble. And right now, across the world, we have legal counsels that continue to grow and grow and grow. And that's not because they're not needed anymore. It's because it's the only thing you've got left if you're going to throw out the word of the Father. And the world's experiencing this now. So... Are we supposed to be in this situation? 
Now, we, we're going to have this oppression from Rome, and I talk about this in other series. But in our own lives, in our own gathering, in our family units, in the, how we interact with everyone, does everyone here want to operate according to Rome's few hundred thousand laws of how we should do this, or do we want to operate according to the Father's? See, that is ultimately the choice we're starting to make in here. And that choice is going to bring shalom, and it will bring joy. If, if, we will take this seriously. But the thing that's going to be under attack in all this for men, women, children, leaders, whatever, is our self-sovereignty. Does everybody know that that self-sovereignty can get in the way of (laughs) things? I have, over my life, you know, even teaching this, I am stunned sometimes when I realize who was actually sitting on the throne, and it wasn't the Father in that situation, it was me. And we're, and we're all going to go through this to one degree or another, hopefully less and less, as we start to mature and understand the Father's ways. But we are a work in progress, and so we can all do this. If we're not willing to understand that our self-sovereignty is wanting the throne, we're in a state where we, we are wanting somewhere to be the Elohim of our lives. Now you're saying, well, that's not my tent, that's not me. No, 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 I'm not putting you down and attacking your walk and everything else. What I'm saying is, is that if we could truly see ourselves as a holy Elohim sees us, we might be surprised what the view looks like from his perspective. Not our perspective looking at our own lives. Do you understand the difference? It would certainly help us reduce our self-righteousness. But this is actually ultimately the problem as we discuss all of these issues, okay? So because he knows this is the state we're in, the Father knows the state we're in, he gives us the household rules, he's giving us ways to look at things. So that's okay. This is the platform for which we're doing it from. John 8, uh, 31-32. So Yeshua said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my... Word. Not abide in your version or your opinion. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Anybody here seen arguments where opinions were in the picture and all of a sudden somebody brought the two-edged sword in, the word of the Father, and it started to change the discussion? And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do we often hear that bottom quoted there in verse 32, don't we? Do you ever hear the one before it quoted very often? Oh, the truth will set you free if you abide in my word. Hmm. I know the problems in my life and decisions and silliness or whatever else it is that I've experienced has been a result of that I'm ultimately have not been in the Father's Word in that particular moment, situation, or whatever it might have been. So it comes along and it corrects, it reproves, and it also edifies. Thank you, Joel. I'm going to get the donkeys here. I'm going to be a little bit more about my donkey thing here. This discipleship authority model. What I'm going to try and relate to you today is that there was a structure that Yeshua was relaying to that I give to my ecclesia, my kahal, Hebrew, the church. I give these five things. Okay, what did he give? He gave pastors. Come on, help me. Teachers. Evangelists. What else? Prophets. Apostles. Now, just the very nature of that statement suggests that we have a team game or a single game happening here. <laughs> it's a team game. So as we see people brought and maturing, and as the Father brings these into our midst, do we want to make life more or less difficult for them? Because we're going to have a look a little bit of a look at what Paul says about this as well. But I want to tell you this. Often I say people who want to be in a, in a true biblical leadership model are generally people that have never been in one. It's not fun sometimes to be at the front of the line in any given situation. And you can be at the front of the line in one situation and, not, and be somewhere else given the scenario and the circumstance. 
Okay? But when you're here, whenever you're at the front of a line, who's in most danger as you're navigating something? <coughs> it's okay. Speak up. The one on the front. Whether there's something to fall into, whether there's an adversary going to jump out at you, the enemy's going to be coming. The one in the front is going to generally be facing this if they are taking their leadership role um, seriously and correctly. Now, the one who's going to take the initial hit or is going to see the danger or may experience something on your behalf, do you want to be giving that person a hard time? But we see this all the time. In the body. Because the one right behind them, notice where their nose is. Is this donkey here perfect? No. But they're still called in that situation, whatever it might be, to walk that path. And if you're biting at their rear end and their hind legs and everything else, are you making it harder or more difficult for them to be aware of danger, to understand what's coming, to help navigate the situation? Has anybody here tried to be doing something and somebody keeps trying to talk to you? You're trying to concentrate on something and they're going, hey, and they're bugging you. I mean, mothers would be able to put their hands up immediately on that one. How is it like trying to actually get something done when that's constantly happening? But what if, what if we were doing that as a body to those that were called into a servant to leadership position? See, we're going to be able to relate this at every level of the model, right? From the family nucleus up. And it applies all the way through. Generally what's happening is, is that those who are trying to be obedient or walk in the Father's way in a servitude leadership position tend to be the targets. Yet scripturally, we are warned against doing this. Take out that front donkey and make life difficult for them. Believe me, you're going to make life difficult for whatever this whole line is. And it's not a place we want to be. Maturity is vital for the survival of moving forward. We do not want to have the less mature in front of the more mature. So we want to work this out. And if we bring this into a spiritual context, which I will be today, then this these are matters of our very survival. So if we're all going to be hearing from the Father and doing, I hear from Him and I do what I want, camp... What we have is a whole bunch of donkeys trying to cram their way on a little narrow path. And it's not going to work. Some people are going to get hurt. This has been taken out. Yet, I, you know, I have this kind of from a leadership perspective in my corporate life. I can talk about certain principles biblically. I won't tell them that I'm speaking from the Torah. And they sit there and they hear it and they know it and they listen. They actually understand the wisdom they're hearing. Yet I can speak about some of these subjects in the body of Messiah, and somehow it's causing people, oh, I don't know. How is it that Rome can hear the wisdom and not even know they're hearing it? Because I'm just not saying that I'm speaking from chapter such and such. I have found that it's actually the body that is busy trying to justify itself more often when hearing the wisdom of the Father than it is actually Rome. I teach on certain matters to unbelievers using biblical wisdom. And they think, wow, where did you learn that? We argue about it. Yet we claim it's the word. Respect the one in front of you. Whatever situation this is going to be, and this is going to vary, because guess what? A lot of people in this room, in any given time, and even in a point in the day, you might find yourself being at the front of this row. Help the one behind you in that situation. If we can actually learn to do this as a body and actually do it the way he asks, you know what? We're going to have people respecting the one in front of us. And helping the one behind us. Because a true servant to leadership position doesn't go, oh, well, whatever. It actually cares. It will actually fight to ensure that there is not going to be harm to that which the Father loves. 
And that which is truly in his way is going to be knowing that this is where this person has been called and is in the situation. Now, we can all see this in the shadow pictures of family nucleusism, raising children, and so on, in the family dynamic. Here's the other one, and this is the one I've, I've, I can't even go on enough about when it comes to at least a lot of the fellowship that I enjoy here locally in Wellington. I do not sit here and run around, and I know I don't experience this, so whenever I'm as a part of our local fellowship, whenever I have to be at this part of the line, and I'm not always there, but whenever I am, I can tell you one thing I don't experience anymore. And I am absolutely thankful to the Father for this and what we're experiencing. I happen to be in a fellowship which is sharing the load. I don't sit there running around, can you do this, can you do that? Why aren't you doing this? You're not doing enough. All that kind of a thing. And I'm not getting bit in the ankles anymore or in the rear end. But I assure you, my rear end's still a rear end. But I'm enjoying the reality that they, we are a body. And even though we may not be in a Nicolaitan environment, and maybe I'm not lording leadership over them, you know, and all that kind of stuff, believe me, they are working to get from A to B because they realize it's not all about them. The one here is not saying, well, this is all about me. I don't care all these ones behind me or in front of me, whatever. It's all about me. And certainly, if that first donkey there, whatever this leadership, authority position is, you do not want that one saying it's all about me. One of the most dangerous things we can have that is going on right now is where you've got leaders believing it's all about them. In any given situation, here's a, a little tip. If you're in a scenario... Where something needs to get done. Are you looking to a recognized authority? Does anybody know why we have the orange jackets walking around on security? You see the orange jackets walking around? Hands up if you've seen the orange jackets. Come on. Okay. Do you know that some of these guys are up to 2 or 3 in the morning looking after your interests right now? Who here is happy about that? Isn't that nice? We don't want to make life difficult for those people, do we? They're at the front of the line here, sorry, in the donkey line, when it comes to security. So if you go running to the donkey, if something's going down, yet, you know, we've got Aaron who's heading up a security team, and the issue requires matters of security, who do you want to go to? Do you want to go to the one who's leading the security element here, or do you want to come to me? So there's a reason for these orange Vests. There's a reason why they are in that position. In that scenario, the authority is who? Oh, is it the one who's speaking? That's the guy who wears the stupid hat and he speaks too much. I'll just go to him. Who's the authority if something goes wrong here in the camp and it requires matter of security to be involved? The, the reason for these things is so that we understand the authority in a circumstance, in any given situation. Right now, I may be in a position of servitude leadership and have the authority in what's going on right now in this room regarding what we're talking about. But that doesn't mean I walk out of here and go and tell any one of you how to run your families. I am not. Somebody else's husband or wife or whatever else it is. And the moment we stop understanding these lines, we're going to have people abdicate where they should be and we're going to have people that will start to usurp where they shouldn't. Do you start to see the difference now? And then the whole thing starts to crumble. Because if it all comes around one person, which a lot of the models have been set up, especially in the believing world, and that one person crumbles, what do we see happen to fellowships, to institutions, to you know churches, whoever's been here in a church split or anything else like that? There'll be a few hands. Because it, it all revolved around what? Yeah. This is a team game. And we're all going to step up and we're all going to grow and mature because this is going to be the light and the witness that people will see both inside and outside the camp. To be set apart according to Yah's ways, but to be able to respect each other, but also be able to submit to one another when it is required. Believe me, his model's not loose. 
It just doesn't lord. He is the head of his kahal, but he administers it a certain way. Can we all agree with that? So, we are told biblically not to be respecters of man, but does it say anywhere we are not to be respectful towards one another? Do you see the difference? The definition of authority, Oxford. The moral, legal right or ability to control. The power or right to give orders, make decisions, enforce obedience. The power to influence others, especially because of one's commanding manner or one's recognized knowledge about something. Okay, would anybody have a problem with that being the definition for their four-year-old to mom or dad? What if authority, though, is going right up? Do you know that spiritually, does the father call us well-behaved grown-ups? Is that what the father calls us in the word? Yeah. We go through this process, okay, of having to grow up spiritually. So in matters of spiritual authority, it is real and it exists. So what happens, okay, if... We don't get, now this is basic, this is how Rome is looking at authority. Is it identical to the way Yah looks at authority? Because there is a lot of truth in that. But if I apply that from an institutionally based way to administer his faith, I will end up with Nicolaitism. Actually lording over the people. We see this in, in what gave birth to most and all Christian denominations you know of. We see it in the Catholic institution. Who's the head? The Pope. And then it just goes on down from there and there and there and there and there. So then we look at this structure. It's pyramidal. We go, well, is that actually what we're seeing scripturally? And is this how we're supposed to do it? So we're just going to ask ourselves these questions, Okay. Just keep going and looking at sort of what we actually can sort of unravel or uncover out of Scripture. Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen to 20. And Yeshua came and said to them, Yeshua, Messiah, right? That's a pretty serious place. <laughs> All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Is that some authority? It's all authority. Now, we might be in a certain stages right now. And certainly Hasatan is the God or the Elohim, small g, or small e, of this world right now. But make no mistake who he's answering to. Do you know what scripture says? That he comes before the throne day and night. Then you go back into the, into the Torah. You can see when he's speak, uh, going to, in matters with Job. Who, who had to go and get permission? Or sorry, who was instructed by the Father to go? And use Hasatan to be able to test Job. And was, and was Hasatan given some rules at that point by the Father? Yeah. So we're not in this boxing match thing going on, but we need to understand how this works. When Yeshua says all authority was given to him, can we accept that? Yeah. Therefore, make disciples of all nations. Baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, he, he has all authority. And that's the instruction to us. Make disciples of all nations. So is making disciples growing people, or is it lording over them? Which one is it? Do we actually see a pattern of Yeshua doing that? Was he walking around like many pope? Or do we find that he was asking questions, that there was parable, that there was repetition, that he was modeling something? But was his authority ever in question in a servitude model? No. Was he standing there demanding it? Do we read in scripture where he's sitting there yelling at the disciples, please listen to me, I'm Messiah. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. What was the word at that time? I'll give you a hint. They didn't have a New Testament. All that I've commanded. What, whose will did he come to do? The Father's. So what's, what's our template for actually understanding this? Oh, gee, fancy that. We've gotten back to Torah. How'd that happen? But if we throw the Torah away and now learn how Rome does it, could we get in trouble? And are we seeing some of that 
happening in religious institutions. There is no Torah, which is a standard now. They get to make it up according to Rome. Or their own imagination, or their own thoughts, or their own opinions, or whatever it might be. And because we're in the state that we're in, we like to argue vigorously for our opinion, don't we? Understanding the application of authority. Okay, so 1 Peter 2, 12 to 15. I'm just going to quickly read through this one. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers. So who's going to look at you and give you a bad rap? Yeah. They may see your good deeds and glorify you on the day of visitation. This is interesting. So they need to witness something. They're going to see something in us. They're going to see something that's different. Do we actually look different in how we operate with each other? Forget about what we've learned. Because does somebody truly look at your life? Do they look at this event? Do they look at whatever it is? And do they actually see something different? Or does it look just like everyone else? Be subject for your sake to every, get this, human institution, whether it be emperor or supreme or a governor sent to you by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Now this is interesting, <laughs> for this is the will of Elohim. we got some interesting stuff going down on the earth right now, don't we? Do you know, I find more believers right now is interesting with this whole Trump thing in the U.S., Clinton and Trump and blah, 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 blah. Do you know I saw believers, and this includes both sides of the riverbank, be it Christian, be it Messianic, Hebrew roots. Do you know what both sides seem to have an opinion of and what was wrong and needed to change and this is terrible and da, 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 da. I heard all the opinions of why Trump was of God and why Trump wasn't. From believers. Do you know the one thing I do know in all of this? is Yah's allowed him to be there. And if and as far as I know, he's on the throne. So he's allowed him to be there. Is my job here now to argue politically for or against Trump in a fallen system, in a fallen environment, with a fallen human being? The last I saw, Trump was not looking to honor Yah. So I am now going to cause arguments and division, and I'm going to be sitting there looking to the world that as long as Trump somehow meets my criteria and my mind, we're all fine. This is happening. Is it maybe that we should be actually looking in our own camp, in our own marriages, in our own lives, and be going, you know what, I wasn't asked to evaluate Donald Trump. I was asked to actually look in the mirror and evaluate my life before Yah and his word. Because I don't see anywhere where Yeshua took on Rome. Does anybody here agree that Yeshua could have? If Yeshua said, that's it, I've had enough of Rome, would it have been over? Do you know some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, certainly the Pharisees, they were actually looking for what? A suffering servant or a conquering king at that time? Where are you? If you're the Messiah, deal with this. Now, they weren't understanding their prophecy at that point. Enough Babylon had made it into the house to pollute their whole understanding of how this was going to work. I think we're back there again just on the other side of the riverbank. I think it's possible that we're not actually seeing how prophecy not only is going to be fulfilled literally by him. We spoke about that uh, in the teachings earlier this week. But I actually honestly think that we could get so caught up that we will miss what we're supposed to because we're actually engaging ourselves in things that I don't see our Messiah having ever patterned. Yet he could have done something about it. You can give your opinion all you want on the White House and Donald Trump, and what can you do about it? Yet the one who could, was he protesting? Was he a protesting abortion? Was he protesting gay marriage laws? Was he, pro what was, he, was he doing all this? Now, I'm not saying that makes any of this right, nor that we shouldn't live a set-apart example that we are not for these things. But hear me out. Getting Rome to change its behavior according to a standard which you have willingly crossed over into, into the house of Israel... I think we got enough. If anybody's come into this house, do you start to realize that maybe there's some things that have got to change in our lives? 
who will just yell from our inside the camp to those outside the camp. You idiots! Is it possible that if we get caught up in things that we shouldn't, doesn't mean we accept them, doesn't mean we like them, doesn't mean we condone them, doesn't mean that we can't, but if we actually engage in areas, is it possible we could get sucked into somewhere where we were never called to be? And our very witness could actually be worn down. And not only that, our very bridal garment preparation could be distracted by matters you're never going to actually affect. But I tell you one thing, we have the people of Elohim. Do you know if, if and this is the example I love to make on this, 1.3 billion professing Christians, okay, on the face of the earth. 1.3 billion. Who here knows at least four to five non-believers? Hands up. Just no. 1.3 billion professing Christians decide, I'm just going to read the Torah and do what? He commanded, I'm going to honor Sukkot this year. In one year, the gospel message is witnessed to the earth. Not because we had on fire conferences or reach the nation conferences or something explodes when we get together conferences or whatever else it is. Just us honoring this. One year, his model's not broken. Do you know that places like, from the warehouse here in New Zealand to Walmart in the United States, do you know what they would start sales they would start to have happening? Because because you'd have 1.3 billion people preparing to go camping for a week together. Did, do, wait a minute, you mean Rome would start having Sukkot sales? You better believe they would. Do you see that our witness... Just by honoring it, just that one thing, the whole world's going to go back and go, what's this Sukkot signs all over Walmart? Who's asked to be told the answer? They did. His model, I promise you, we're in for a shock in the Bema Seed, the Judgment Seed of Messiah. It's not broken. Whose model's broken? Maybe ours. You see... If we just do what he asked, is it? I know. I know it's not sexy, people. I know because we don't get these instant results, and I know if we can all go away and have our emotional hypes, we can all go away with our rah rah banners saying, you know, we got together and you know chanted something for three days or something. But if if we actually live this out, is it possible that slowly but surely, as a remnant starts waking up across the world? And more and more people start coming together and just honoring the Father's ways. And although we're not perfect and the, the lead servant leadership position isn't perfect and, you know, whatever. But as we start to do that, is it possible we could start to become an example where we are? Do you know, I know in this city right now, we've got Christians wondering what the heck we're doing here right now. Leaders. And they're actually wondering. It's making them feel a little uneasy. Oh, why aren't we celebrating the wedding with Messiah? <laughs> I don't know about you, but as a Christian, that can start to... Because they talk about the Bride of Christ. They might have wonky views of it all. But nonetheless, they really do. It's like, well, you know, and I asked them, why don't you celebrate the wedding with Messiah? Last I heard that a bride that was getting married to a groom that she loved would be looking forward to her wedding. Is this difficult? Well, it is, because we got one challenge in all of this. We're all fallen. <laughs> and we've got this sanctification process and this wedding garment process to go through. So we now got to learn how to do it his way, but do it in a fallen state. But we have the Ruach. And he has a very, very special primary role in all of this. We're going to look at the nature of deception here. The act of hiding the truth, especially to get an advantage. Okay? So this is just the nature of deception. Does any of the parents here ever seen your children do that? Moms, hands up. Have you ever seen your children do this? Yeah. Did you teach them to do that? <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it may have. Look, we all do this. 
It's one thing a child doing it in your own family nucleus. How about if we start seeing this happen with grown-ups in matters of the faith? What happens when grown-ups start acting like that? And they're in leadership roles. Or they're serving roles. Or they're helping out roles. Whatever roles we're doing... Who thinks that behavior is a good thing to be happening if we all get together here for Sukkot? Who would like everybody behaving like that here? None of us would. But what if our very nature tends to err to or come under little things that we just want to tuck away or do here or I've got my little agenda or I want to achieve this or I kind of want to make this happen so I'm going to you know, go about it and we start to justify certain ways of being and actions. Revelation 12, 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil, and Asatan, the deceiver of what? Some of the world? Okay. We're all in this. And he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Now this event in Revelation 12, 9, I'll tell you right now, I believe, has certainly not happened. The casting down has not happened. Because right now we know he has access to the throne. Has the fall happened with Hasatan and what's going on? Absolutely. But there is an event talked about in Revelation where they're going to be cast down. And the way I look at it is they're going to be put into the same four dimensions, five dimensions, however you want to argue this, as we are. Apparently, he's really upset about that. Maybe he doesn't have the same interdimensional access that there is now. I'm not sure how that will all play out, but one thing I know, he knows his time is short and he's not happy about it. When that event occurs, woe unto the inhabitants of earth is what the word declares. Something's going to come at some point. And it's going to be deceiving that's going to be behind it. And until that happens, because when this event happened, I'm going to propose something here, that there may have been some usurping that's going on that's pre-laying a groundwork for a false messiah to be accepted. Does everybody know you don't look for a hero unless there is a problem, a situation that requires one? A Hegelian dialectic is where you create chaos for change. You're actually the orchestrator of both. What if I could create chaos because I'm small e Elohim of the earth? What if I could create the chaos that will require the acceptance of the hero? If I want to be a hero tonight, I can go and do it. I'll just go down to Wainu. He set somebody's house on fire and then go and rescue them. Next thing you know, I'm in the newspaper the next day. This is the guy who rescued the family from the house fire. Nobody asked the question, then I lit it. This kind of stuff happens. The Gillian dialectic, okay, principle, I believe, is occurring on the earth in a global scale. We're getting ready for something. One of the things that this... Hasatan has always been a master of and is doing to his day is that he is going to do it within. Who do you think the target is? The believer or the unbeliever, according to Scripture? The believer. And when Paul says, when you start to get these matters, put on the armor of Elohim. That's not an instruction to Rome. That's an instruction for us. Usurping versus rebellion. We often get these two very confused. Now I'm going to start giving in a little bit of the definition to somebody who's asking the question. We get these two confused, okay? You serve. You take control of position of power, especially without having the right to. Now you better understand authority matters in order to know you're even doing that. Do you understand that? Rebellion is an action against those in authority, clearly understood, against the rules or against the normal and accepted ways of behaving. So rebellion is a knowing position against a knowing authority. Usurping is a little bit more subtle. This one's a little different. Because what if I could confuse your ability to understand, accept, or even be able to see authority? What if I could come up with philosophies like, oh, well, we don't need leaders. Oh, I, we, just, we all hear from God ourselves. 
What if I could create things and start sewing it into a situation where you wouldn't even know that you're being tricked? Just remember this. To take control of a position of power, especially without having the right to. Now, these are very legalistic definitions. So don't think power in the sense of, you know, I'm the one. Just think of it in this situation, okay? If this is occurring here in the body of Messiah, forget Rome. It happens in Rome, believe me. But if this is happening in the body of Messiah, could you take something down with that principle in play? Who here is comfortable of anybody taking control of a position of authority or power at any given time according to their view and standard of something? Are we happy to live in that environment? I know most of the people here aren't. But is it possible we could get deceived into doing this? Is that possible? You anyone accept that? Is it possible we can be deceived into this? No one here is going to willingly, I think, want to participate in that. I hope not anyway. Except maybe Mark. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ezekiel 28.15 You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness, you read that as Torahlessness or lawlessness, was found in you. Okay? So this is interesting. Is there any usurping going on here? It's going to test this. Is that rebellion or usurping? Yeah. We actually have a form of rebellion going on here. Does anybody here think Hasatan didn't know who the boss was? <laughs> Do you think he still knows who the boss is? Yeah. However, he knows, and perhaps what had happened was, he took how many with him? How many angels went with him? Is it possible, though, they needed to be tricked? See, we don't consider this, right? We think a third of the angels actually went, yeah, let's go against the throne and we get into the good versus the evil and next thing you know we got this big Hollywood production going on. Yet, we don't actually see this, especially recorded in something interesting in the book of Jude. We're going to look at that in a sec. Was the order of authority in the garden post-fall? Okay, so what was this post-fallen? Adam was put in charge of overseeing the garden as declared by Yah. That's because he likes men more than women. Is that why? That's why he did it. He wants to oppress women. Yeah. <laughs> the world wants you to believe that. This is post-fallen, by the way. This is after something's gone down. Very interesting to talk pre, but we're going to talk post. Adam was given authority by the Creator now in this instance. Does anybody realize that men and women are designed differently? And do you know in a fallen world, those different designs now actually play out in a very interesting way. Does anybody know that the creator might have picked a design for a certain reason? It wasn't based on equality or intelligence. <laughs> See, we buy into the equality intelligence argument, don't we? We're not allowed to have the design argument anymore in the world, are we? Does anybody think that's fair? No, no, you will, you will argue the narrative as Rome tells you to. And Rome says you must argue it from a worth position, a quality position, an intelligence position. And when you buy into this, and I buy into this, and anybody in the believing world buys into this, we will start to bring these principles into the camp. If the male part of this in a post-fallen position was given a place of authority of overseeing a structure of a family unit. Does anybody think the creator got that right? This is a pretty tough one. Hey, gee, aren't you guys glad I'm the one up here having to say this? It's not very popular what we're saying right now because the world wants to absolutely deny a creator. Does anybody think Yah got it right with his own creation from a post-fallen position, do you think he just took a wild stab in the dark? Because this is the place we're now left to contend with. If you don't think that he got it right, I don't know why you're here. Go back to Rome. Rome doesn't think the Creator got it right. 
They don't. You've got lots of friends out there in Rome. They'll all agree with you. You can gather them around your house and you can all discuss why the Creator got it so wrong. Or we can find out and discover that maybe the narrative that's been pumped into us that we've bought has got nothing to do with actually why he's done what he's done. Can you hear me now on that? Is that possible? That actually things are designed to do things? Who here thinks putting water where the oil goes in your car is going to do you well for her? What's going to happen after a while? And if that car breaks down, because you kept saying, well, no, I don't like putting the oil there. I like putting the oil here where the water goes. It's my car. I'll do what I want with it. And you now take it to the manufacturer after the engine is seized. And you're sitting in the manufacturer, give me a new car. This thing doesn't work. What, what do you think the manufacturer says to you in Rome? So, when you, so let me get this straight, sir or madam. You've been putting oil where the water goes. Yes. And the car broke down and seized up. Yes. And you want me to replace it. Yes. Does anybody think that's acceptable to the manufacturer? Is it possible we're starting to look like this before Yah? Unless you have an electric vehicle like Josh, then he never buys into this analogy anymore. <laughs> I'm going to come up with one that covers you too, so that you won't be able to do that. Look, is it possible we're the proverbial people now maybe coming before the designer going... What's wrong with this thing? And we're the actual ones that are actually doing it. Is that just possible? And and who's going to be the example of doing it right if it's not us in this room? It's going to be Rome. Rome will start doing it right. They won't. Rachel goes, why? <laughs> they won't. My facetiousness is not meant to be sarcastic or to be shameful upon anyone. I speak to me before I speak to anyone in this room. Do you know who the guiltiest person of usurping in the body Messiah that I know in this room? Who do you think that is? Besides Mark. <laughs> who, 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 do you think, who do you think that is? It's me. No, it's not Brad. It's me. Okay. Do you know that I've come out of a system and was a part of things and until I was open to this, I didn't realize that I was usurping because you know what? My intention has never been to usurp anyone. And I really believe with you, your intention is not to usurp anyone. And my intention wasn't. Because you know what the Father did to me? In a time of crushing, in a time of despair, in a time of the tears flowing down my face and so you understand this, Curtis. I know you love me the best you know how. But what you're doing, regardless of your intent, is hurting the body. And what's happening to you, regardless of their intent, is hurting you. I experienced the brutal reality of what usurping really looks like. And the price I paid for what I'm, what I'm saying to you today, I assure you, is real. If you knew my testimony, you might understand why I'm sharing some of the things I am. Please take seriously that I don't believe anybody in here intends to usurp one another. Or even wants to. But that doesn't mean that we don't or can't. But if we could get the Father's wisdom in us, is it possible that we could reduce usurping in the body of Messiah and actually allow this thing to work the way it should? Would that be a nice place? Let's keep going. He was given this by the authority. So this order of authority in the garden. Creator. So was Yah out of the picture at this point? No. Adam goes in there and now Eve. So this is an authority that's now going to start the fallen world. The Father is working with the position that we are now in and he is saying, I know my design and this is how it's going to work and this is how it's going to kick start it off. Does anybody think Adam and Eve had some serious wisdom to pass on as they got this thing going? Yeah. And roles and everything else. Does anybody here, does anybody here think Eve was less smart than Adam? 
Do you think Adam was smarter than Eve? So, if this is the order, when did it change? Has this changed? Is he the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? So, if I can't find where this changed, just this basic order, I know I'm simplifying it, we are in the summary version of this too, but even if, okay, we want to have discussions about this design, which is good and healthy and right, I still can't find where a certain fallen position design has changed. So it's important that we get a healthy, balanced understanding of what it is. Because I promise you, what's the narrative we're allowed to speak about in the world, generally speaking, right? We have to either be Republicans or Democrats or national or labor, whatever, in our politics. And we get bought into these narratives, don't we? As if you've got to pick a side. So this is the side now you're being told to pick. You've got to pick the feminist side or you've got to pick the chauvinist side. Yet most people I know are not feminist nor chauvinist, certainly not in the body of Messiah. So why are we having the discussions where the smallest amount of the narrative is occurring? It's ridiculous. Out of the house. Who here wants to be a feminist? Who here wants to be a chauvinist? Why are we having the discussion? This is his camp, not ours. Guess what we get to talk about? We get to talk about his ways, his design. I don't care what Rome wants to say on the matter. Because Rome didn't create it. So why are we interested in it? If we get rid of this narrative and have the conversation where we need to have it, we might just discover that this might lead us to being an incredible witness to the world. I can't actually, I don't have enough time to get into what actually went down in the garden. I'm going to have to skip through this. I'm sorry. This is a big one. What I will say is this. Eve got, we'll, we'll just touch on this one. Eve was deceived. Did Eve usurp? No. In fact, we're quite clearly told in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament, right? And Timothy's trying to use an example of something, which I'm going to briefly mention, that she was deceived. So we talked about deception right at the beginning of this. And she was in a glorified state or unglorified state? She's in an unfallen state and she's being deceived. Whoa. Who here thinks Eve might have been a little bit more intelligent than us? She was in a better state than us. And she's being deceived. Look at this. We are told that the fiery dart, I believe there's only really three. All of them will fall under this. There's three fiery darts. We're told about this in the Brit Hadashah revealed in it. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Every form of sin against the Torah you can think of, I promise you, is going to fit under one of those three. These are the fiery darts of the enemy. Not thousand of them, and I'm firing this off, and the, you know I've got the temptation of heaters versus the temptation of the clothes pegs, and I'm being attacked by the demon of berries, bushes, or whatever's going on out there. Okay, just think of these things that are firing at you. Now let's just see, just analyze exactly. This is an unfallen creature, infinitely sentient being, infinitely more intelligent, I believe, than us, at least in that state, glorified. And this is what she's facing. So when the woman saw the tree that it was good for food, lust of the... Hmm, that's interesting. That it was a delight to the eyes. Lust of the... Or desire. And the tree was desired to make one... Whoa. Do you mean even in this state, there are principles at play? And people say, oh, well, we're returning to the pro, you know, pre-fallen world where nothing can go wrong. Where everything is good and we live in fantasy land and there's fairies and pixies and wherever else is going on. Or is there something going on here that's bigger? And I suggest to you that there really is, but we're not going to be speaking about this today. But I promise you this. Adam and Eve, there's a riddle. What didn't they have? What didn't they know? 
Was it actually a finished work at this stage? Does anybody know what they didn't have? What's that? Well, they didn't have the knowledge in good and evil, but what does that bring about ultimately? Because the, 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 he's not giving them a complete lie to fool her, is he? Was it true that they got the knowledge of good and evil? He said, surely you will be just like Elohim, knowing good from evil. Was that a true statement? Yes, it was. What was the lie in this? You will not surely... Ooh. Okay. So a part truth to create the deception. Here's what's interesting. What if I told you, did Adam and Eve know what unconditional love was? See, you may have experienced it. Anybody here own a dog? <laughs> it's, um, it's close, but bring food in the equation. You might find that that loyalties can change quickly too. Did they really know what unconditional love was? You see, why did he bother with this? Could Elohim have stopped the event in the garden? In fact, who allowed Hasatan to even be placed in the midst? Who did that? We don't want to talk about this, do we? Is Yah in control or not? Is your Elohim on the throne or not? Who allowed Hasatan to be there? Now you've got to ask yourself, why? You don't have an option now. We don't get to change this. All we know is that he allowed it or he didn't and he's really trying his best but there's this big bad Hasatan guy that's fallen. Or he knows exactly what's going on. And he's still allowing it. Why? Why allow this thing called life? Why allow any of this? Because Rome's out there. Has anybody ever heard that? Has anybody ever heard from Rome? Well, if God's real, why does he allow this and that and da-da-da? Who's not faced this? Why does he allow all those kids to die over here? And why is he allowing this over here? Don't you hear Rome crying this? Yeah, we're told we're supposed to be able to give an account for the hope that's within us. What if we could get a whole skewed view of how this actually really works? What I want to say to you is this. If Eve can be tricked into something, be deceived into something, that now is going to start to contaminate us, it's possible that us in this fallen state, thousands of years later and much more regressed, is it possible that our spiritual knowledge, or I'm so, I've made it. (laughs) Is it possible whatever we think we are, warns us in scripture that we don't, we shouldn't think of ourselves higher than we are. These are the things that make me go, hmm. Because we need to contend with them 